Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the library at Calvary Road Baptist Church in Monrovia, California. We are located in the People's Republic of California, the southern third of the state. Um, and uh, yesterday, there was a Trump rally in Beverly Hills. Day before yesterday, there were Trump signs popping up on, on uh, private uh, properties around Pasadena. And two days ago in Woodland Hills, there was a group of pickups. And aren't the Trump followers always guys who drive pickups? <laughs> but they were driving through Woodland Hills when someone shot at them with a high-powered rifle. So uh, it's getting a little dicey here in Southern California. Today, uh, here in Monrovia, it got up to 110 degrees. It's about that right now. Uh, one of our church members reported just before we went online that it was 114 at his home. Uh, one other church member reported that it was 115 uh, underneath his back awning. Um, and so my, um, my suggestion to both of those guys is get yourself indoors and turn on the AC. Let me remind you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and to click the bell reminder to be notified of uploads from this channel. If you're watching, if you're watching via live streaming, um, if you have a question for me, uh, please feel free to send it to, I think it'll focus here in a second send it to pastor at calvaryroadbaptist.church. And if you will put Zoom 54 in the subject line, then I will know which one of these sessions uh, you are referring to. Last week's se Zoom session was a discussion um, about the issue of who has the wisdom to lead. Uh, two weeks ago, we, uh, we looked at the, the, the online ministry of a, of a preacher now in Africa, Bodhi Bokum. Bokum, Bokum. I don't, I don't know how to pronounce his name. Tonight, we're going to address the issue of Booker T. Washington, not the singing group. Booker T. Washington versus W.E.B. Dubois. Dubois. Uh, both of them turn of the century, turn of the 20th century civil rights figures. And so let's go to the Lord in prayer, shall we, at this time. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We appreciate the opportunity of gathering. We are so thankful that we live in a technological era, that we have opportunity not only to communicate at distance from each other, but also to enjoy the benefits of uh, heat exchangers and compressors and evaporators and things like that. Uh, and the air conditioning cycle. We appreciate so much, Mr. Carrier, and uh, pray that you might bless our session this evening as we uh, expose people to the lives and the approach to civil rights problems that these two men both had. Thank you for this opportunity. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> uh, our country had a very sad legacy. <clears throat> And of course, the sad legacy was um, legalized slavery. Uh, when the United States of America came into existence in the, um, in the 1780s, I think 1785, um, every country in the world had legalized slavery. Um, at the beginning of the 19th century, uh, there was a British uh, Christian and member of parliament, um, can't remember his name offhand, but he began a very long-term campaign to make slavery illegal in uh, the British Isles. Uh, he was successful in that. Um, he then was successful in persuading um, the, uh, Great Britain to prohibit the transport of slaves on the high seas. And so the, the, um, the British Navy, which, which had reached around the world, um, began to stop and, 
and seize um, slaves that were being transported from Africa uh, to the New World. Uh, they would take those slaves off the ships and release them at the nearest uh, place they could uh, that was feasible and appropriate for them. And, they, uh, and then they would penalize uh, the owners of the ships. And I, th I think they did that by, by simply seizing, their, seizing their, the ship, seizing their property. Uh, following along um, the actions of those Christians in Great Britain, the abolitionist movement, of course, took off uh, in the United States, and um, the movement was taken up by um, uh, civil rights uh, pioneers. Um, Frederick Douglass <clears throat> was a very prominent black leader who was an escaped slave, made his way to the North, um, and a number of preachers uh, in the Northern states uh, rallied against uh, the institution of slavery and the rightness of it uh, by revealing the wrongness of it in their sermons and in their personal ministries. Uh, and so obviously you know that the Civil War was fought. Uh, a number of amendments to the Constitution were passed. Uh, slavery was abolished. Um, slaves were made citizens. Slaves were given the right to vote. But in the aftermath of uh, Abraham Lincoln's assassination by John Wilkes Booth, who was a Democrat, um, then the, the Northerners instituted a harsh uh, approach to occupation in the South that um, had more effect on um, reinforcing belligerence against the North and Northern values than possibly even the Civil War. It was into this milieu that Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois were born. So let me give you a very brief biographical sketch of Booker T. Washington. Uh, he, of course, is most well known as the longtime president of the Tuskegee Institute and W.E.B. Du Bois, who is most well known for the role he played in founding the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP. First, Booker T. Washington. Uh, his full name was Booker uh, Taliaferro Washington. He was an American educator, was an author, uh, was quite a wonderful orator, and he was an advisor to multiple presidents of the United States. That would be Republican presidents, mind you, not uh, belligerent racists, um, meaning, of course, the Democrats, um, such as Woodrow Wilson and others of his ilk. But between 1890 and 1915, Washington was the dominant leader in the African-American community and of the contemporary black elite. They recognized his intelligence. <clears throat> they recognized his influence. Born in 1856 uh, in Virginia, he was born into slavery. Um, he, uh, he died at a relatively young age in November of 1915 at Tuskegee, Alabama, aged only 59 at the time. We think of that as very young now. Um, but his resting place is a, is a plot at Tuskegee University. W.E.B. Du Bois, um, Dub William Edward Burkhart Du Bois, I pronounce it Du Bois, but it's actually probably pronounced Du Bois. He was an American sociologist, socialist. Yeah, they call him a socialist. He was a communist, uh, historian, civil rights activist. Uh, Pan-Africanist, whatever that means, an author, a writer, and an editor. He was born in uh, February 1868 in Massachusetts. So he was a northerner. Booker T. Washington was a southerner. Keep that in mind because that affected everything about these two men, in my opinion. Uh, W. E. B. Du Bois was very angry with 
Booker T. Washington. Oh, he was. He admired Booker T. Washington's intellect and appreciated his accomplishments, but he was very, very strongly opposed to the position that was set forth by Booker T. Washington in what's called his Atlanta Exposition Address. You can Google all of that. Um, Dubois saw very little future in agriculture for the black community, uh, was of the opinion that the nation was rapidly industrializing, and he felt that renouncing the goal of immediate complete integration and social equality, uh, even in the short run, he thought that was counterproductive, exactly the opposite strategy for what best suited African Americans. So W.E.B. Du Bois was a communist, which meant a, a communist believes that there was nothing essential about the nature of a human being that can't be warped and pushed and changed uh, if enough force is applied. Um, his um, childhood uh, could not have been more different than Booker T. Washington, being, of course, born in Massachusetts as a free black. Uh, he attended first Fisk University and later became the first African-American to receive a PhD from Harvard. He secured a teaching job uh, at Atlanta Universe, uh, University where he was of the opinion that he learned a great deal about the African-American experience in the South. Now, now think about that a moment. So here we have a Northern academic who goes to teach at an Atlanta, Georgia university. So he's still in academia and he thinks from inside the bubble of academia that he has an appreciation for the life and the plight of the African-American community of the deep South. He was a staunch proponent of a classical education. That is to say he wanted, um, almost everybody to be taught Latin, to be taught Greek, uh, to be taught um, uh, uh, other languages, to be taught rhetoric, uh, to be taught the, what are called the, the classical arts. Um, and he condemned Booker T. Washington's suggestion that at this place in history, and at this locale in the southern half of the United States following the Civil, uh, the Civil War, Booker T. Washington's uh, studied opinion was that at this time, the black community mainly focused on acquiring vocational skills. Um, without an educated class of leadership, Dubois thought, whatever gains were made by blacks would be stripped away by legal loopholes. And so he believed that every class of people in history had what he called the talented tenth. In other words, 10% at the top of the intelligence pyramid and, and the, down, the, the downtrodden masses he felt should rely on their guidance to improve their status in society. So basically he was, because of his socialist and communist leanings, he was a top down governance kind of guy. He believed that the, that the legislated elite uh, should tell other people what to do and how to live their lives. Uh, political and social equality in his mind had to come first before black people could ever hope to have their fair share of the economic pie. And so he vigorously attacked the Jim Crow laws of the South and, and was very strongly opposed and, and rightly so, uh, opposed the practice of prohibited um, black voting rights. In 1903, he wrote a book titled The, the Souls of Black Folks. Um, and, and then he was involved in something called the, the Niagara Movement in 1905 uh, in, in Niagara Falls on the Canadian side with a group of 30 people. And, and they drafted a series of demands calling for an immediate end to all forms of discrimination. And it was denounced as radical by most white people of the era, uh, even though most educated uh, African-Americans supported the resolutions. Four years later, of course, uh, those guys formed the NAACP. 
Uh, the organization sought to fight for equality on the national front. It also intended to improve the self-image of African-Americans. That's a nice way of saying the racially mixed people of color living in the North found themselves embarrassed by, by the boorish behavior of plantation era blacks moving to the North who didn't have what they felt was appropriate social manners, table manners, uh, speaking habits. They weren't cultured, they weren't refined, they weren't sophisticated. And, and so uh, it, was, it was really the NAACP was, was formed by um, black people of the North who had some social position and status and, and they looked down upon the newly arriving to their cities, blacks who were immigrating from the South to work in the factories. Um, as time passed, Dubois began to lose hope that the situation would ever change completely. Uh, he wanted to bring heaven down to earth uh, via communism. He, he, he believed that that wouldn't happen. In 1961, he moved to Ghana um, and, and, and he died at the age of 96, just before Martin Luther King Jr. led the historic civil rights march on Washington, D.C. A completely different person is Booker T. Washington. At the dawn of the 20th century, nine out of 10 African-Americans lived in the South. Jim Crow laws of the segregation ruled the land. Now, Jim Crow laws are those laws that were, that were intended to make it very difficult to vote, very difficult to register to vote. Uh, one example would be in some states, in order to register to vote, uh, you had to be, if asked to do so, cite uh, from memory the Constitution of the United States. Well, of course, the registrar of voters didn't ask white people to do that. He only asked black people to do that. And, and he, they would typically let a couple of blacks in each county register to vote as long as, as they understood who they were to vote for. Um, and so it was, it was really bad. The Jim Crow laws were really bad. Of course, uh, I remember when I was a little boy um, living in the South, they had uh, two sets of water fountains, two sets of bathrooms, two sets of restaurants, two sets of hotels and motels. Uh, I remember when the New York Yankees would do spring training in, uh, in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, that the New York Yankees baseball team would stay at the Yankee Clipper, which was a beachside uh, resort in Fort Lauderdale. But Elston Howard, the black catcher on the New York Yankees, he had to stay across um, Highway A1A at a hotel called the Dan Yankee. And so uh, they could stay at the first class resort hotel. Elston Howard uh, stayed at the second class. Uh, and, and though it, it was it was terrible. Um, I attended the first um, integrated high school in Fort Lauderdale. And I, re I remember the first couple of months, it was very, very tense. And, uh, but uh, it ended up being a very, very good experience for everyone who was involved. Now, although the 15th Amendment empowered blacks to vote, uh, the literacy test, as I just told you, uh, poll taxes and outright violence and intimidation really drove, that, that's, that's real suppression of the black vote. So people who today say that requiring that you have a picture ID uh, is voter suppression. Uh, I've never heard of a black person who didn't carry voter ID around with him. Um, and so uh, it, it, that's, that's different than the way it used to be. It used to be bad. Uh, economically, African-Americans were primarily poor sharecroppers who were trapped in an endless cycle of debt. Now, for the most part, that's true, but, but also remember that around the turn of the 20th century, the, the only brick masons in the South were black. Uh, the only coppersmiths were black. The only plumbers were black. Because of slavery, white people did not know how to do things that got their hands dirty. 
So the skilled tradesmen of the Deep South were all black. Uh, the carpenters, the plumbers, the brick masons, uh, the cement workers, all of those kinds of guys, uh, the roofers, they were all black. Um, and Booker T. Washington wanted to take advantage of their, of their skills. Uh, now, granted, very few uh, black people were accepted as equal to white, uh, but Booker T. Washington's approach was to not walk up to a white person and demand to be treated equally. Um, his, his view was, was different. Uh, he was a man that dealt with what I think of as enlightened self-interest. Then there's the founding of the, of the Tuskegee Institute. Of course, Washington was born in 1856 into slavery. He had experienced racism his entire life. And so he, and he became one of the very few African-Americans to complete school, and he became a teacher. He was absolutely committed to a practical education that would put food on the table right now. And so he established the Tuskegee Institute in Alabama. He was 25 years old. Uh, he believed that Southern racism was so entrenched that to demand immediate social equality would be counterproductive and produce a very strong adverse reaction. And so his school uh, sought to train African-Americans in the skills that would be helpful to most. Uh, teach them carpentry, teach them plumbing, teach them roofing, teach them brick masonry, teach them uh, advanced husbandry uh, so that they could raise livestock uh, successfully, uh, teach them uh, farming uh, techniques, so crop rotation and all that so that they could be more productive farmers. The Tuskegee Institute became a, an actual center for agricultural research the most famous uh, of them being uh, George Washington Carver. Um, he was a tremendous uh, scientist uh, dealing with agricultural things. And um, so as a result of the Tuskegee Institute, those who, were the, those who went to school there and those who were influenced by his philosophy and his approach uh, benefited, benefited tremendously. Um, in 1895, Booker T. Washington delivered a speech in Atlanta, Georgia, that enraged W.E.B. Du Bois. Uh, Washington adopted the position that vocational education was the best thing for most Blacks, and that learning Latin and Greek, that didn't help anybody living in the South. Uh, he, he, was, he advocated abandoning short-term goals of social and political equality. He argued that when whites saw African-Americans contributing as productive members of society, equality would naturally follow. And let me give you an illustration of this in my own life. My grandfather, or my mom and dad, I don't think had a racist bone in their body, uh, but my, both sets of grandparents were racists in this way. They generally thought, thought that, uh, that black people were inferior and that they should be racist, but they were never that way toward individuals they knew. Um, I imagine that's what Booker T. Washington discovered, that there's something about humanity that when even a racist comes to know someone that he has prejudice against, just the normal ongoing daily interaction over time will produce a realization of the humanness of that individual and the prejudices will begin to melt away gradually. Those dreaming of a black utopia uh, which would be communist, like Dubois, he, uh, Washington declared. He said, just cast down your bucket where you are. That's the phrase. He's, and and, and, and um, uh, a lot of people um, embrace what Booker T. Washington uh, advocated. And so um, 
Let me just summarize at this point, because I would urge you to do Google searches of both men, Booker T. Washington, W.E.B. Dubois, a look carefully, and you'll see that one of them was a communist, although they don't like to portray him as a communist now. That seems to have lost some favor. But their, their, their general approaches to life and their, their worldviews were different. Uh, Booker T. Washington, in my estimation, I would describe him as a man who lived in the world of is, while Dubois lived in the world of ought to be. Okay, one of them lived in the hypothetical, one of them lived in the practical and the pragmatic. One was a Christian and the other was a communist. One calmed the fears of whites and did not believe that it served anyone's long-term best interest to have a majority population that held all of the reins of power scared of you while the other delighted in scaring many white people. Uh, one was a man of the South. He lived in the South. He was born in the South. He grew up in the South. Um, while the other was a man of the North. He was born in the North. He grew up in the North. He was educated in the North. He uh, embraced the affectations of the North. And he thought he knew the South from living in a bubble of a university in Atlanta. Uh, one of them prized scholarship. The other prized hard work and the gradual acquisition of private property along with the acquisition of trade skills. The other had kind of an attitude toward people who got their hands dirty and people who sweat to make a living. So in retrospect, make up your own mind about W.E.B. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington. I would suggest that you look back and ask who does history treat better? Um, and you might, along the way, asking these kinds of questions, um, ask a, f a fellow by the name of Thomas Sowell, S-O-W-E-L-L. -L. Thomas Sowell is now 90 years old. He's an economist who was born in, he was born in North Carolina, raised in, in Black Harlem, uh, dropped, out of the, uh, uh, dropped out of high school, went into the United States Marine Corps for several years, um, after he got out of the Marine Corps, he went back to college, eventually uh, graduating from Harvard University, got his PhD in economics from the University of Chicago, uh, where the, the great Nobel Prize winning uh, 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 Milton Friedman uh, was, a, was a professor. Uh, he then taught at several major universities and then for the last, you know, 40 or so years has, has devoted himself to research and writing. He wrote a book called The Economics and Politics of Race. And this is one of the things he discovered that no matter where you go in the world, if you look at an ethnic, popu an, an ethnic minority population in a country, it could be, um, Indians living in Black Africa, it could be Indians living in South Africa, it could be Jews living in Brooklyn, it could be Irish living in Boston, it could be Italians living in Philadelphia, um, it could be uh, ethnic Chinese living in Bangkok, Thailand, and all of these all over the place, okay? Uh, it could be Irish living in East London, where everybody's white, but that group's talk talks way different, and they're Roman Catholic, and this group talks very different, and they're Church of England. And this is what Thomas Sowell discovered, which I think Booker T. Washington had an innate grasp of, even if he never verbalized it the same way. Thomas Sowell 
did a study of ethnic minority populations around the world, and this is what he discovered, that ethnic minority populations that try to seize political power, whoever they are and wherever they are, there is a predictable reaction by the majority. The majority becomes frightened of them and begins tamping them down by passing their version of Jim Crow laws. In those parts of the world where you have ethnic minorities that do not try to grab hold of the reins of political power, but busy themselves in their ghetto or in their group or in their community by, by simply uh, starting businesses and, and servicing the needs of the larger a majority ethnic population around them, then you discover that those ethnic minorities in whatever country they are in, within one generation, have a higher standard of living and income than the dominant majority population. So he pointed out that in Boston and New York City, the Irish came over and immediately they went political. And after three or four generations, the Irish of Boston and New York City were still on the low rungs of the ladder. And those who had come in after them, because Irish started coming in the 1840s, those who came after them, which would be the Italians, uh, which would be uh, the, the Jews from, from Russia and Poland, immediately started ascending. Why? Because they did everything they could to avoid involving themselves in local politics. They didn't want to make the majority population angry with them. Um, and, and Thomas Sowell discovered that that's, that's the case in, in, in South America. That's the case in Australia. That's the case in different parts of Africa, whether it be a minority tribal group you go to, uh, go to Nigeria, and it used to be under, under British uh, colonization that there was one tribe when the British first got there that was a small tribe that was ferociously dominated by another majority tribe and slaughtered. Uh, that small tribe, when the Brits arrived, this small tribe, they collectively decided that we're going to go after an English education. We're not. We're not. We're not going to. We're not going to try to. We're not going to try for a political equality. We're going to go after the education that these Brits who have arrived with it have. And as a result, that that tribe now dominates Nigerian politics. Uh, if you get an email from a Nigerian saying that he is a prince and that for some money from you, you can help him tap into the box of gold containing $80 million. He's probably not from that small tribe that got on top. But if you know somebody who has moved to the United States and is now a, a university professor at uh, here in the USA, uh, I would bet you beans to buckshot that that Nigerian is a member of that small tribe that decided some generations ago that they were not going to get into a political fight with anybody to try to grab the levers of power. But what they were going to go after was, was education and, and job skills so that they could fit into that British culture. And, and, and the results have, have borne it out. Uh, Look at what happened to the Cubans that came over to Florida uh, when Fidel took over. Uh, I was living in Southern Florida and, and, and the Cubans that came to Miami uh, to get away from Fidel, uh, they, they did not start jostling and, and wrestling with people for control of the local jurisdictions and to gain power. No, 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 no. They, they hunkered down. They learned English. Uh, they started businesses. Uh, they started educating their children so that by the time their children graduated from college, their children had a very good education, much better than mom and dad. That's what happened to the Russian Jews who moved into Brooklyn and, 
and, and to the Bronx, um, exactly the same. Their, their, their parents came over uh, with very few skills, uh, very bad education. Uh, they spoke Yiddish, uh, and gradually they would learn English, and they would set up a very, very little shop, or maybe uh, they were a street vendor of some kind. And uh, what their goal was, was to get their children set up in the United States of America. They, they may have gotten jobs as garment workers. Uh, most of the garment working industry in New York City for, for many, many years uh, were Jewish people. And, uh, and, they, and they devoted themselves to working hard, saving their money, and getting set up for the next generation. And, and these ethnic minorities, and I think Booker T. Washington recognized that, is that not every problem can be solved in your lifetime. It may very well be that when you recognize a problem, and it doesn't have to be a racial prejudice problem, it can be any other kind of problem. Um, but but the, the problem, if it appears to be insurmountable, it probably isn't. It just takes a longer view than demanding something from somebody else that may scare them out of their minds. And what you want to do is, is you want to, you want to, you want to uh, take steps to implement a long view solution uh, to the problem, a long view approach. You want to be a strategist rather than a tactician. That's what Booker T. Washington uh, advised. Um, and um, I could tell you stories about, um, um, I'll, I'll tell you one more story before I, before I wrap it up. When my father graduated from college on the GI Bill, um, and it was uh, not too long before I was born, he started applying for jobs and they were very hard to get because in 1950, all of the GIs were graduating from college at the same time. So my dad, uh, got a job working for the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And his first job was to be the teacher of a one room schoolhouse at Cherry Creek, South Dakota. My mother's job, because they hired her too, was to be the would be the, the cook who would cook the midday meal for these kids. And it was way out on, on an Indian reservation. There was no electricity. Um, other than the batteries uh, at the house we lived in, and there were three other houses occupied by government employees. But it was so far off the grid, there was no electricity, there was no indoor plumbing, there was no indoor sewage, uh, there were no, uh, no bathrooms, indoor bathrooms, except in these four government-built houses. And so my dad uh, had an opportunity to meet the last living survivor of the Battle of the Little Bighorn, and the last living survivor of the massacre at Wounded Knee. So after living there for several years, my dad uh, got a promotion from being a one room schoolhouse teacher for grades one through eight. He got a job, they transferred him to Cheyenne Agency, South Dakota. And my dad became a high school ag teacher. Now my dad had just about a master's degree in agriculture um, and so he was, he was, uh, he had expertise in horse and cattle breeding, uh, range management, all those kinds of things. And that's something that the Native Americans of, of that reservation, that's what they prized because they were still people who prized uh, having herds of horses. One of the guys that taught in the same school my dad taught at was a black man by the name of Leroy Bogan. My first memory of a guy who had a different color wasn't Indians, because I was around them all the time, and it, I, I didn't notice the difference. But I remember my, my, my earliest memories of childhood are, are when I was five years old, and we are driving south from South Dakota heading to Texas. My dad and his friend, his colleague, a teacher named Leroy Bogan were sitting in the front seat. My dad was driving. He's a white guy. Leroy Bogan sitting in the right side passenger. He's a black guy. In the back seat is my mom 
and me and my baby brother. All is good. These two guys getting along and they're telling stories and they're enjoying each other's company. And they were, they were very good friends anyway. Uh, in, in private conversation, I will teach you how uh, Leroy Bogan handled racism when he was interacting with Native Americans, but there is absolutely no way am I going to put it on a YouTube video. <laughs> but anyway, um, when we going through South Dakota, all is fine. Going through Nebraska, all is fine. And then I, as a five-year-old, I'm always looking around and asking questions and nonstop chattering and all that. And in Kansas, I noticed we're stopping twice. We stopped to get gas and use the bathroom at a gas station. Filling stations they were in those days, not service stations. Some of you are old enough to remember. And then we almost immediately stopped at another filling station for Mr. Bogan to use the bathroom. That was weird. And then when we went to a restaurant or, or a, uh, a diner to get food, we would get food for us and then dad would drive to a different part of the community and Leroy Bogan would get food for himself. That was weird. That was my first exposure to segregation. So they had whites only water fountains, colored water fountain, whites only bathrooms, colored fountain. Whites only restaurants, colored restaurants. I thought it was weird. I didn't know what to make of it. It just is. All through Kansas, it was that way. Through the panhandle of Oklahoma, we busted through that fast. And then we went to Shamrock, Texas, which is the town just south of where my mom and dad were, were going. And Leroy Bogan was headed all the way to Beaumont, Texas, which is down south and east of the Dallas-Fort Worth area. So they had already agreed that, that he could ride with us until we got to Shamrock, Texas, and then he'd just hop a bus. And uh, that's the last I ever saw of Leroy Bogan. Um, but Leroy Bogan's family approached life the way... Booker T. Washington did. He had told my mom and dad his story. His father was a chauffeur for a rich white man. His mother was the maid for that rich white man. They had eight children. While they worked for that man, they saved up their money and scrimped and scrimped and scrimped and scrimped. And their oldest child went to college. And mom and dad paid for it so that he could go straight through college without having to work. Then that child got a job and that child paid for the college of the second child. The second child then paid for the college of the third child. And they did that all the way down the line. All eight of their children got college degrees. The eighth child paid back mom and dad. And that became mom and dad's retirement nesting. Some problems cannot be solved in one lifetime. Do I think that uh, Leroy Bogan's dad enjoyed being the servant of a rich man? No, I do not think he enjoyed that at all. Do I think that Leroy Bogan's mother enjoyed being the maid of a white woman? I, I do not believe that she enjoyed that at all. Then why did they do that? Because they lived in the world of is that doesn't mean they were happy with it. It doesn't mean they were satisfied with it. And it didn't mean they weren't going to do something about it. And this is what they did about it. They took care of the next generation so that the next generation 
would be of an entirely different socioeconomic class without making anybody mad, without scaring anybody, okay, without freaking anybody out. Now, it would be nice if, if their exposure and experience had been at church, because at Calvary Road Baptist Church, we find that those kind of issues disappear when white people come to Christ and when black people come to Christ and when Hispanic people come to Christ and when Asian people come to Christ, then those problems get worked out. And we have at Calvary Road Baptist Church something which reminds me of Acts chapter 13, verse 1. You go and look at that church at Antioch, that first Gentile congregation whose spiritual leadership was provided by some guys who were obviously Jewish Christians, some who, one who might have been an Edomian, one who was at, without doubt black, and another who was a Gentile because the real approach to dealing with these kinds of problems is the grace of God. I think that Booker T. Washington's approach was affected and influenced by the grace of God in his life. I don't know whether the man was a Christian or not. I do know this, he was not a communist, he was not an atheist as W.E.B. Du Bois was. Communists try to create heaven on earth, and they don't care how many people they kill to make it peaceful and wonderful for everybody. The biblical approach is to recognize there's never going to be heaven down here. Heaven is heaven, and it's the promise that God gives to his people for eternity but wow does it sure improve when you're dealing with two people who would seem to have so many differences maybe they have a different amount of melatonin in their skin maybe the shape of the nose and the thickness of the lips is different maybe for those who have hair some have straight hair, some have nappy hair. Some have black hair, some have blonde hair. Some have black eyes or brown eyes or hazel eyes or green eyes or blue eyes. But if what you have in common is Christ, grace is the remedy in this world for racial prejudice. And you show me a person who claims to be a Christian and he still clings to this racial animus toward other people just because they look different, sound different. If he's a Christian at all, he would have to be a new Christian or, or an immature one. You can't be a mature Christian and be that way. No, 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 no. The, the Savior squeezes that out of a man. Grace displaces racism. So what do you add to get rid of it? God. <laughs> Put G in front of race and what do you have? You have grace. The grace of God pushes that stuff out. And so um, I, I, I think it would be good for those of us living in the 21st century to re-educate ourselves about the life and the impact of two men, men, men of powerful intellect and tremendous influence who had different worldviews, different experiences, and different approaches to solving the same problem. And then make up your own mind who you think was right and who you think was misguided. Thank you for joining in. If you have a question, please feel free to email a question to pastor at calvaryroadbaptist.church.
Let's conclude, shall we, with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your goodness and appreciate so much the opportunity that we have to gather and to do a look at history. Uh, I'm so thankful for Booker T. Washington. I appreciate the opportunity of, of going to the birthplace of his most famous scientist, uh, uh, George Washington Carver. He did so much for peanuts um, and for so many other things and, and such brilliance. Um, I'm of the opinion, Lord, that what counts is performance. And, and if you'll give a man an opportunity, a chance, um, however small that chance is, uh, he'll, he will, uh, he'll rise to the occasion he will make use of his opportunity and he'll prove himself. Um, and so I'm thankful, Lord, for the grace of God. I'm thankful for the example of the church in Antioch. I, I'm, example, I, I'm, I'm thankful for the wisdom that was displayed in the life of Booker T. Washington. What a towering figure in American history. And what a, what a great regret that there are so many who don't have any idea who that man was. Bless his memory, we pray in Jesus' name.